Speaking of paperwork, before we get to our interview, which is coming up shortly, I got I got th this is <clears throat> somewhat of a lengthy email, but it has some it has some actual real reflection on the formative years of the greatest artistic wrestling thespian currently in the arts today. And I won't mention anyone's names here that are writing this email, just in case. But uh, apparently, as we will find out, Kenny Olivier has done numerous shoot interviews knocking Harley Race and saying that Harley Race didn't like him and he had no idea why. So if you are one of these people who listens to the simpering sound of that Neanderthal voice and the dull-witted, bland comments that he makes, and you've heard this, here's more to this story. Are you ready for this, Brian? Are you ready for this? Yeah, I didn't know Kenny Omega rips on Harley Race. I didn't know anything about this. I didn't know it either until I got this, but apparently it is indeed something that he has done. Dun, 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 dun. Are you ready for this? Hello, Jim. Kenny Omega has said in numerous shoots that Harley Race didn't like him and he didn't know why. In the course of recounting this story, Omega has enjoyed mocking Harley, portraying him as an uneducated old man. Well, I have the full story to set the record straight because I was one of the trainers at the 2005 Harley Race camp that Omega attended. As mentioned, Omega attended the 2005 Harley Race Pro Wrestling NOAA training camp that was also attended by Johnny Ace, who had come to see Kenta Kabashi. The first drill that myself and the other trainer ran on day one of the camp was a simple spot to attempt to gauge the ability, or lack thereof, of the 50-plus guys and girls attending the camp. The spot was lock up, take the head, shoot off, tackle, drop down, leapfrog, hip toss, get the head back, and reverse. That's a, that's a standard warm-up spot in a lot of wrestling seminars. Omega was in the ring with one of Harley's guys, Dakota. When the two got to the leapfrog, Omega ducked when he should have jumped. The two collided, and Omega busted Dakota's nose all over his face. Harley stopped the spot and yelled at Omega, saying, 20 people have already run this spot before you two. Why were you not paying attention? After we ran through all the guys, there were two groups formed, beginners and advanced. The beginners I took to a separate building where we worked on more basic stuff and spots. The advanced stayed in the main building and ran practice matches. Harley picked Omega to be in the beginners group, not just because he messed up the spot and hurt someone, but because it was obvious at that point he was self-trained. He rushed everything, went a million miles an hour, and had what we called happy feet. Please see the top <laughs> of the program and or the Twitter feed at That's Our Mongo for more visual illustration of happy feet, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, uh, back to the email. It was obvious to us if he was allowed to work matches in the camp on that day, there was a high probability he was going to hurt someone. When his name was called to go with me to the beginner's class, he immediately went to the head trainer and asked if there was a mistake because he thought he was better than most people there. Steve told him no mistake was made, that he needed more work and needed to slow way down before he would be allowed to work matches for us. Kenny was under the assumption that because he could throw the prettiest drop kick in the camp that he knew how to work. Therein lies the problem of a lot of indie guys. During the course of the camp, Kenny was allowed to work matches, and Johnny Ace liked his personality, not so much his work. Of course, remember now, two of Johnny Ace's protégés in OVW were Mark Jendrak and Sean O'Hare. So, there you go. He's rich. <laughs> Laurinaitis has been a talent picker from way back. He also signed the wrong one-legged man. Signed the wrong one-legged man, yes. And he got the divas for an entire generation out of lingerie catalogs. But anyway, <laughs> um... During the course of the camp, Kenny was allowed to work matches, and Johnny Ace liked his personality, not so much his work. This immediately went to Omega's head, and I'm sure justified his reasoning that he was the best guy at the camp. This was basically our only interaction with Omega back in 2005, all except Harley's wife, BJ. BJ was a great lady, who found out weeks later that Omega had falsified some of his paperwork to obtain his wrestling, lines for the, wrestling license for the state of Missouri. That might have been from being one of those Canadians. Um, I hadn't thought of or heard of Kenny Omega after that camp until he started turning up in Japan and doing these shoots that insulted Harley. 
Harley mellowed out a lot in his later years, but it's a shame that 1970s Harley never showed up to confront Omega on the crap he had been talking. But I mean, at that point, Omega had been in the business for a whole four years or so, so of course he would know better than an eight-time world champion. I mean, Harley Race never did a cross-legged fisherman neckbreaker. What does he know about talent? Signed, name withheld. And one Harley story that was a PS, it, this, is, this is Harley Race. He says, another time I was riding with Harley. He said he was in Denver one time, and four guys jumped him after the match. This would have probably been back in the AWA in the 60s when he and Larry Henning were a team, right? They were the hottest heel team in the company. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's no footage of them as a team. Apparently, they were fantastic together. Yeah. Well, Harley Race in his fucking late 20s taking bumps and Larry Hennig. Young, oh, my God. But anyway, he was in Denver. Four guys jumped him after the match. He couldn't shake him, so he grabbed the nearest one. This goes into what we were talking about here a couple weeks on the program and what the uh, ago on the program, what the old timers used to say and do. He couldn't shake him, so he grabbed the nearest one, stuck his thumb under his eye and popped it out. He then turned the screaming man around to his friends <laughs> who freaked out and ran away. Harley said he then used the one-eyed man as a human shield to get to the dressing room. He then threw the guy aside, slammed and locked the door behind him. <laughs> I'm telling you, everybody's like, what the fuck? All these fucking stories about what if the, all these old timers were fixated on fucking eyes that's what you did in the riot i was told this 30 40 years ago when i first got in the business if you can't get the balls go for the eyes and and they used to be able they had the fucking i mean it doesn't if you know what you're doing it's not any big deal to take your thumb and pop somebody's eyeball out of the socket and that definitely gets their attention whether you you know separate the whole thing from the head or just dangle it there but can you imagine turning a fucking guy with his eye, eye hanging out of his eye socket next to his friends like, you're next, ah, and using him as a fucking shield? What would the world look like if one of your eyes was in your face and the other one was dangling down the side of your nose? Yeah, I've always wondered that. Do you still see out of that eye? Do you still see everything I that's think going it, on? <laughs> in, I, until it's actually plucked, I think you do. Oof. Maybe not well. You got to be something going on. Maybe an, an ophthalmologist can check in with us. Remember on. when they did the work shoot with uh, Kevin Sullivan and Brian Pillman? That was one of the things they did in one of the matches where they made it like Kevin was going for his eye. Yes. Because that's naturally actually what Kevin would do if he was in a situation like that where a guy wasn't cooperating and was giving the problems. He'd go for the guy's eye. So they played up on that. I mean, the average fan probably didn't realize what was happening, but... A lot of that was to work the boys and work everyone else. Well, but also, I think the average fan would probably pick up on if you're trying to gouge a motherfucker's eye out, the chances are that relations have broken down. So, you know, but it, but it fit. That is what, yeah. And and anybody coming, there, there were things they used to tell you. It, the, the fans, if a fan hits the ring, try to catch them coming through or under the ropes because that's where they're going to get fucked up because nobody is used to watch when... Local celebrities or politicians or anybody that's not in the business is introduced at a wrestling match, how they get in and out of the ring when they're trying and they're being allowed to walk in. They, they get hung up in the ropes anyway. When guys, especially if they were drunk, they'd fucking come charging that ring. They'd either try to go head first, diving under, in which case you got to meet them with your fucking foot right up under the goddamn nose, drive the fucking nose bone right back in the goddamn, in their cranium. That'll get their attention. Uh, catch them coming under the rope, or if they try to jump up and come through, they're going to be flummoxed in the ropes for a few minutes and get them that way and go for the eyes. Uh, or if you're, if you're on the floor and you can't fucking, you know, get somebody off of you, go for their eyes or their nuts. It's a specialized art, not, not used a lot anymore. Now the fans hit the ring because they think they can do a better job than what they're fucking looking at, not because they want to attack anybody. They're like, fuck, here, let me show you how to do this. And they're, thank goodness none of the heels have any heat because they probably get their asses kicked because I look like Lex Luger compared to most of modern wrestlers as far as size. I, you know, so half the people in the fight, the men in the crowd and some of the women are bigger than the fucking heels.